So uh, a lot of life changes have happened since I started pastoring here. Um, and even if you haven't had a personal conversation with me yet, I'm sure you would have picked up on these changes as, as, as you, you know, would hear stories uh, from my sermons. Uh, you see, I used to mention quite a bit about the dogs that we have when I first started pastoring here. But since about a year or so ago, those stories started to change. And I can't recall that I've, uh, you know, brought them up in a hot minute. And so, yeah, our world has been pretty much uh, revolved around Maddie. Uh, and so when people ask me, hey, how are Toby and Miso doing? I'm like, who? Oh, yeah, I've got two dogs. And so I figured a, a good way for us to uh, start off our time together is to uh, revisit Toby. So Toby is a miniature schnauzer, and schnauzers are known for their voices. Some consider it as a gift. Uh, Toby thinks it's a gift. While others, myself included, do not think it's a gift. But if you spend some time with Toby and observe how he communicates, you'll notice that the inflections of his barks signal different messages. For example, a high-pitched, constant bark with squeals interlaced in between means that there's someone at the door that he knows and he's excited to see. On the other hand, if it's a, a loud and constant, aggressive-like bark, then it means that there's someone dangerous at the door he doesn't know. And it could be my neighbor, it could be the delivery man. A single bark in the seated position means that he wants your attention. He wants scratches, he wants treats, he wants whatever it is that you're eating. A howl means that he's sad and he's lonely, or he's empathizing with someone else who is sad. And then, knowing me, you know I gotta mention this. If he's silent and just staring at you into the depths of your soul, it means his poop is stuck and he needs help <laughs> removing it. See, communication is tough work. Um, it, it's taken Joanne and I years and years to better understand what Toby is communicating and what we're trying to communicate to him. We don't speak the same language, but we certainly learn to pick up on both the verbal and nonverbal cues that display. But even then, there are times when either I or Joanne would get frustrated at his vocalness because he's not understanding what we're trying to say and vice versa. Now, even if you don't have pets, the same experience applies to all of us uh, as humans in the way that we communicate with one another. It's hard work. Right? Knowing when to listen, when to speak up, when to read in between the lines, and when to take things at face value. How to pick up on verbal and nonverbal cues. It's a, it's a lot of work. That's why even people who are CEOs or have been married for a long time or lived a long life still run into instances where they misunderstand or miscommunicate. Uh, and if you're falling with me, if you understand how much effort communication requires, then you should also recognize that, um, that it takes a lot of work, heavy lifting on our part to also communicate with God. No matter if you're a new believer or if you've been a believer for a long time, it takes intentionality to not only see how he has revealed himself to us through his word, through his son, through creation, but also it takes intentionality to respond accordingly to his revelation. How often we seek after the God who has revealed himself to us and go about communicating with him reveals the depth of our relationship. How often we seek after God and go about communicating with him reveals how intimate we are with him. If someone were to observe our prayer lives, our thoughts, our hearts, what would they say? So the question I want uh, us to explore this morning is how should we pray? How should we talk to? How should we commune with our God and King? Um, we continue on in our series on Luke. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 13. I won't have it on the screen, so I highly encourage you to uh, pull it up on your phone or in your physical Bible. Luke chapter 11 verse 1 through 13. As we journey through our text this morning, I'm just going to point out a few key observations and then leave you with the way that you can faithfully respond. So again, just going to highlight a few things that I want you uh, to see, to bring to your attention so that we can all walk away, hopefully, with the guiding principle and response. So 
Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it happened that while he was in a certain place, he being Jesus, praying, when he stopped, a certain one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be treated as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation. And he said to them, who of you will have a friend and will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, because a friend of mine has come to me on a journey and I do not have anything to set before him. And that one will answer from inside and say, do not cause me trouble. The door has already been shut and my children are with me in bed. I am not able to get up to give you anything. I tell you, even if he does not give him anything after he gets up, because he is his friend at any rate, because of his impudence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. But what father from among you, if his son will ask for a fish, instead of a fish, will give him a snake? Or also, if he will ask for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Therefore, if you, although you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father from heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you, are, if you have ever paid attention to the Lord's Prayer, or what's known as the Disciples' Prayer, that we pray every Sunday, you should have noticed that this prayer, as recorded by Luke, is a little bit different. There are some phrases here that are missing in Luke's account when compared to the one that we pray every Sunday, which is more similar to that from Matthew's account. But you can trust both accounts because if you were here last Sunday, you would remember what me and Raleigh discussed at our coffee chat, that the Bible was not written to us, but written by a few authors who are writing to a particular group of people or to a particular person in a particular time. And these writers who, who wrote in different genres like poetry and satire and narrative and so on and so forth had different purposes for their writing. That what Matthew was doing in his gospel, which is what we pray almost every Sunday, is, is different than what we find in Luke. And so Luke records in chapter 11 that as Jesus is praying, one of his disciples seek, is seeking to understand how to pray, especially since John the Baptist had taught his disciples how. See, in their time, the rabbis, who were teachers that people would listen to and commit their lives to follow, they would teach their disciples a prayer. And this prayer would accomplish two things. First, it would brand or highlight the key messages of that rabbi to distinguish uh, himself from other teachers. And second, it would provide a communal sense of identity for the disciples and their following of the master because they would pray this multiple times a day. And so for us as people who claim to follow Christ, who pray this prayer every Sunday, it's also important that we take the time to understand the prayer that our Lord and King model. So this prayer can be understood in primarily two sections. The first revolves around who God is, and the second revolves around what he can do. That to understand the second, what God can do, cannot be accomplished without understanding the first, who God is. And how do I know this? Notice with me the pronouns that appear throughout the prayer, or you know, as Raleigh has mentioned, the theology of the pronouns. First section, Father, may your name be treated as holy, and may your kingdom come. Notice who Jesus uh, addresses the prayer to, it's to the Father. Whenever Jesus refers to God in the Gospels, we see him almost always calling God as the Father, or my Father, or Father in Heaven, 170 times. And, and you can see an instance of this also at the end of our text today, verse 13. How much more will the Father from Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This title of Father gives off a sense of authority, and it gives off a sense of intimacy. It's the Father who loves the world in this way, as John says, that He would send His one and only son. It's the father who empowers the son, who raises him 
from the grave and exalts him above all. It's the Father who dictates the order of things that are to happen according to his plan. It's this Father that the Son is in perfect fellowship with, and we as believers get to be in fellowship with because of the work of the Son. And it's this Father who has all authority that we get to be near to in our prayers. Father, may your name be treated as holy. May your name be treated as holy. We talked about uh, this last week, this idea of holiness, that God is unique. There is no God, and there will never be a God like Yahweh. And it's not just this idea that nothing can compare to him, but also that God is totally in the midst of. He, he's set apart, but he's not separate from. When we think about the Old Testament and how the Israelites were able to approach God when they could, God was not far from them. You remember the tent of meeting or the tabernacle or the temple, the holy of holies, all of which were places where God dwelled and where only a select few who represented Israel could enter in on their behalf. And sure, there were laws that were set in place to guide Israel and how they were to approach God, but it all starts with God making his dwelling among them, tabernacling with them, and ultimately condescending himself through Jesus to live among his creation. Treating God's name as holy is much more than, you know, not saying, oh my God, or, or whatever way his uh, name may be used or dis misused or disrespected. If that's what we focus on, if that's a takeaway, then we just lose ourselves in legalism of it and miss out what Jesus intended here. May your name be treated as holy as a call for, uh, for the disciples, for us as followers of Jesus to remember who God is and to remember what his kingdom is about. May your kingdom come. That's the next petition in this prayer. For the disciples, they were witnessing in real time God's kingdom come on earth through Jesus' acts of healing and bringing about shalom to the lives of people he touched. If you will remember with me, uh, starting in chapter, Luke, in chapter 3 of Luke, there was a man who was healed from an impure spirit. And then there was a man who suffered from paralysis that was lowered through the roof by his friends. Levi, the tax collector whom Jesus ate with. The centurion and his dying daughter. The nameless woman who washes Jesus' feet. And Luke continues on. From the demon-possessed man to uh, the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years to Jairus' dead daughter. Luke has been building a case for Theophilus and others to see that in the person and in the work of Jesus, God's kingdom has arrived. Now, what was prophesied in Isaiah 35, that the, blinds of the, uh, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be opened. The lame shall leap like the deer and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. It becomes a reality through Jesus because God's kingdom has come through him. And for those of us on the other side of the cross, shouldn't we pray with urgency about that for God's kingdom to come? That justice and righteousness and peace and love would fill the earth. I mean, just take a look around us and take a look at ourselves. Every day, not only are we confronted by our own sin and fallenness, we're confronted by the evil and the violence that we see in this world. Little children go to school in fear because they don't know if a shooting will happen on their campus that day or not. That's messed up. May your kingdom come as a cry for God to restore what he created because we need to be delivered from how much we have fallen short in our cultivating, in our governance of what God has entrusted to our care. It's a reminder that in our rebellion, we just make a kingdom and a name for ourselves. And so again, examine how you pray. Examine your heart. What are your intentions? What are your thoughts? God, help me with this thing. Give me an A on this test. Help me to do well in this SAT. Give me this job. Give me this spouse. It's a whole laundry list that we send to God that's ultimately about ourselves and our world. But from what we've unpacked so far, the aim of prayer really isn't about to get something for ourselves, but instead it's to be close with someone. It's to know who God is. Prayer isn't transactional. It's relational. It's, it's intimate. You know, it shouldn't be, God, if you do this for me, then I promise I'll do something 
for you. Instead, Father, may your name be treated as holy. May your kingdom come. You know, I didn't marry Joanne just so, you know, we could have a kid or I could get something from her. I married her so we could grow close together for the rest of our lives. And the longer we're married, hopefully the more close we get, or the closer we get, the more we grow in our marriage, the more intimate we are, the more that we know each other. And, but if we think about marriage in this way, why do we treat our covenant relationship with God just merely out of convenience? Why do we only seek him when it's you know, easy for us or when we desperately need him? But outside of that, we don't approach him. When we go back to the context of what's happening in Luke, especially back in chapter 8, see, after Jesus is transfigured on the mountaintop, the disciples fail to heal uh, the sick and to cast out demons because ultimately they lost themselves in, in the power that they were given and lost sight of who their master was. Who we are ultimately is rooted in who God is. How we identify ourselves is ultimately and how we know who God is. He is our father, and we are his sons, and we are his daughters. So this first section of the prayer helps us to reorient our posture to who God is. Now, as we continue on in this prayer that Jesus models for his disciples, again, I want you uh, to notice the pronouns. We move from your name and your kingdom to Father, give us, Father, forgive us, and Father, lead us. In essence, once we've turned our glory and our gaze to the Father and His holiness and His mission, now we can begin to pray for God's help in our lives and for what He can do. So first a petition in this second section, give us each day our daily bread. Well, this petition may not have much of a bearing on our situatedness, especially here in America. Uh, this petition has huge implications for the disciples. If you remember the instructions that Jesus sent out uh, to the 72 when he sent them, he said, don't bring any money, don't bring any provisions. Instead, eat whatever is given to you to the people, from the people that take you. In other words, disciples, 72, you have to trust that God will provide for your basic needs. And then if we move back one more chapter in Luke chapter 9, what happens when the disciples find themselves as inadequate to feed the 5,000 plus people? that are there receiving Jesus' teaching. They're not the ones that provide food. It's, it's God. God provides food from five loaves and two fish that not only satisfies each and every person that's there, but also there's a basket full of leftovers for each disciple to hold. Both of these instances put on display who God has been and what he has been doing since the beginning of time. He's the giver of life who sustains his creation. That the God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old. When he led his people in their exodus from bondage under Egypt, he didn't leave them to just wander, to go about their merry way alone. He sustained them with bread, with life from heaven, manna. And if you know that story particularly, the Israelites were instructed to only grab what they needed for each day. Because if they were to grab more for the next day, for fear that they wouldn't have enough food, that extra bread would spoil. So in other words, you know, don't worry about the next day and its troubles. Don't be anxious about whether or not God will show up. He will always, always meet your needs and the needs of his people. The God who we should esteem as holy and who has all authority and who is the creator of the universe and who ordains even things that go beyond what our finite minds can comprehend he cares about even the smallest and most basic of our human needs. And not just our basic needs, but also our spiritual ones too. The next petition, he forgives us of our sins. What I want to bring to your attention is uh, the line that immediately follows. Follow, Father, forgive us of our sins on the basis that we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Forgiven people are forgiving people. Forgiven people ought to be forgiving people. Otherwise, we're just taking for granted the lengths at which God has forgiven us. If Jesus is able to say to his father, 
right before he dies, the most humiliating death on the cross, Father, forgive them. Them being the soldiers who were mocking him as he was being crucified. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. Then who are we? In other words, how dare we withhold forgiveness from others? If Jesus willingly and lovingly and sacrificially died for the people he created, yet these people chose to be in rebellion against him, aren't we just mocking what he did on the cross when we decide to withhold forgiveness from those who sin against us? The sad thing is I think all of us fall under this category that we want mercy and forgiveness to be extended to us when we're caught in sin. But when it's someone else who has done wrong, when it's someone else who has wronged us, we want them to bear the full weight of the consequences. How individually minded and selfish we are that we would forsake the body of Christ, which is what God intended for our edification. We would forsake that just so we can cover our own skin. That's why I believe Jesus chose to close his prayer the way that he did. The last petition, do not lead us into temptation. Do not lead us into temptation. Not that God you know, leads us to sin or, or tempts us to rebel against sin, but that we thrust ourselves in total dependence on the Father. Help us, Father, that we might not act against you. As our proclivity, proclivity as our inclination is to sin. Help us, Father, that we would yearn for your spiritual protection and yearn for your authority in our lives against our own selfish desires. Here in the West, we, um, we celebrate the self-made person, right? And for those of us who are uh, immigrants or children of immigrants, we value the hard work, we value the sacrifices that were made to get where we are in life. In other words, forget others, Forget God. You know, look at me. Look at what I've done. Uh, even whatever stuff I label as, quote unquote, for God or quote unquote, for others, is really just to make myself look good. It's very Pharisaic of us, which is why I am so thankful for this model of prayer that Jesus provides and teaches his disciples, which the early church prays three times a day which we pray in every service. It is my, my hope, my deep desire that when we pray the Lord's Prayer here on out, every Sunday and every worship service, that you're reminded of who you are praying to and what you're praying for. It's not just empty words that we just see on the screen. Or the same old prayer that we pray every Sunday. It's an act of submitting ourselves under the rule and under the love and direction of our Father, of our King. And it surely is not just a prayer for me, myself, and I. But notice again the pronouns. It's a prayer for the communal, the corporate body of Christ. Just as disciples in their communal identity as followers of Jesus, when they learn this prayer. And in some sense, not only are we relying fully on God to meet our basic needs or our spiritual ones, but that we, as we pray, we also go and be a neighbor. We go and seek the good of those that are in fellowship with us. Every Sunday we receive the Eucharist. Who's missing from the table? Who's missing from our fellowship with each other? Who's hurting? That when we pray this prayer, we remember these people. We seek the good of others. Now, all this we've unpacked earlier in Luke, and it's amazing to see what Luke has been building up and what Luke is doing in his uh, narrative and how it's all coming together. Now, what Jesus does uh, next in verse 5 through 8 shows what I believe how we can faithfully respond to his teaching about the prayer. So he shares a, a hypothetical situation that if you have a friend who's taking this long journey to come visit you, and this friend is planning to arrive, you know, just past midnight, you would want to be a good host. In fact, from the, from the law and from Jewish customs, it was expected of you to care well for the foreigners or for these travelers. But the issue that exists is that you've run out of bread for the day. You only made enough bread to last you for the day. And because it's such a big deal to be a generous and hospitable host, 
you quickly rush over to your friend's house and you knock on the door. Please, I need bread. I need bread to give to, to, give to this friend of mine that's traveled far. But then remember, there's another stumbling block. It's midnight. And back then, uh, people lived in one-room houses or homes, which means that children, parents, grandparents, everyone slept together in the same room. Uh, now, we're in a different time, a different culture now, but if you knocked on my door, seriously, if you knocked on my door after we just put Maddie down to sleep for the night, I would be so mad. And mad is an uh, understatement. You know why I'd be so mad? Because first, remember what I said about Toby? Ooh, stranger at the door, bark, 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 bark. And then what happens after his barks? Maddie wakes up. Maddie, who's taken a whole hour to put to bed. And now we have to repeat the whole process. I would be so mad. But that's now. Imagine back then, everyone lived in the same room. The nerve that you would need to do that and to keep knocking until your friend gives in and provides you the bread that you need just so you can be a good host to your other friend. It takes boldness. It takes persistence. It takes a sense of shamelessness to do that. And that's exactly how we ought to pray to God, Jesus says, with boldness and shamelessness and with great intention. Jesus goes on in verse 9 to lay out the, the results from praying in this way. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open for you. This is what happens when you go in boldness, and when you go with shamelessness, and with great intention to your neighbor for bread at midnight, so you can be a good host to your traveling friend. And this is what Jesus promises to us when we approach the Father in this way. For what kind of father would troll their child and give a snake when they ask for a fish? What kind of father would troll their child and give a scorpion when they ask for an egg? And if human fathers who fall short in their parenting and in their discipling of their children towards Christ's likeness still know how to give good gifts to uh, their children, how much more willing is the Father of heaven going to give of himself, specifically the Holy Spirit, to those who ask? This uh, concept became so real to me early Saturday morning. Uh, Maddie would not go back to sleep after she woke up for a feeding at 4.30 in the morning. I knew she was tired. She was yawning. But even after multiple attempts, I was unsuccessful in rocking her back to sleep. And by this time now, I looked at the clock. It was 5.30, 6 in the morning. Sun's come up. Can't believe I just wasted a whole hour of my life trying to just rock this girl back to sleep. But I knew she wasn't feeling good or, or comfortable. Um, but didn't matter what I knew or what she was going through. I was just mad at this point, beyond caring. And so Joanne takes Maddie from me and gives it a shot. But, Im but immediately Maddie gets even more mad because she's no longer, you know, in my comfort. And so she reaches out for me. But remember, I'm so mad, I'm beyond caring at this point. Her hand reaches out for me and I go, slap it away. And then Maddie began to cry even harder. Woo. Therefore, if you, although you are evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more would the Father from heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? Our Father is so eager, so generous to give all of himself to us if we were to ask. Two comments I want to leave with you before I, I uh, wrap up. First is we've got to reclaim this childlike mindset when we ask God for his help or when we seek his present presence. You know, just like from the story that I shared or even in, in general in my interactions with Maddie, she's really simple-minded in her communication with me. She doesn't think about how she can shape things or frame things or phrase things in a way or justify herself even in a way that I would be more inclined to love her or to help her. She either just, you know, points to something or she persists for my attention until her needs are, net, are met. She looks to me and comes to me to provide for her and to meet her needs because she is utterly dependent on me and Joanne for care and for provision. 
in some sense, she is shameless and totally honest with her request to me. Dada, I don't care if you're you know, up at 4.30 and if you're sleep deprived. I want your presence to comfort me. And in the same way, let us be bold and shameless in our communicating with our Heavenly Father through prayer. I'm not saying that we approach the throne of grace uh, with disrespect, like how some of us may treat our fathers from time to time, or that we treat God just merely, eh, just my friend. But even in his holiness, even in his awesomeness, he's not far off. He's approachable. He's accessible. And this brings me to my second cons- uh, comment. As we're encouraged to come to our approachable and accessible Heavenly Father in a childlike manner, with boldness and with a shamelessness, it doesn't mean that God will grant our every ask. He's not some magic genie in the bottle that we can rub who just merely exists to serve us and to grant our every wish. You know, how silly and terrible of a father I know I already am from that story, but how more silly and terrible I would be if I just let Maddie, hey, just watch as much TV as you want. Hey, just... Just do whatever you want when you want. Just get every toy whenever you want. Just eat whatever whenever. But at the age you know, she's in right now, she's not even thinking about that. It's not even what she desires. Her small world isn't so complicated and, and tainted. At the end of the day, all she wants is to be in the presence and the care of her parents. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we need when we need and is so eager to meet that need because at the end of the day, our biggest need, whether we realize it or not, is for his presence in our lives. It's for his presence of authority and protection and guidance and love. That's what this prayer is all about. It reorients us to fully and wholly and totally depend on God. Let me turn your attention again to what's going on in Luke. I already mentioned the 72 in the prior chapter. Right? But as Jesus sends them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to bring healing in his name, how are they sent out? Jesus tells them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Do not carry a money bag or a traveler's bag or sandals. They go out with nothing. Because even in their partnering with Jesus to proclaim his kingdom, they themselves are to seek God and to wholly and totally depend on him. How much more would the Father from heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Not only is this true with spiritual matters, but even the the most basic ones as uh, Martha, right? Mary and Martha later in chapter 10, as Martha is seeking to be a good host, which we've already said is a commendable thing. And rightly so. Jesus invites Martha to not miss out on the necessary thing, which is God himself who, was, who is the creator of the universe, who sends his son, Jesus, to be our deliverer, and who equips us with the Holy Spirit unto every good work, unto Christ's likeness. Revisiting Toby and his communication with us, I think there's a lesson to be learned, even from a dog. He's excited when there's someone good at the door. He's alert when there's something dangerous at the door. And he's honest and vocal when he needs help, you know, with poop or when he needs my attention, when he wants care and provision. Excited when someone he knows is at the, when someone's good at the door, alert when there's someone that he doesn't trust at the door, and honest and vocal when he needs our provision and care. I hope that we communicate and we pray to God in the same way. That when there's, when God is, is gifting us something good in our lives, that we're excited about that. And we're tempted to sin. Or when Satan is drawing us away, that we be alert And when we're in need, when there's nothing we can do, that we immediately run to God and seek him and to depend on him rather than try to figure things out in our own strength, in our own power. I hope we go to the Father as the Son goes to the Father. If you notice throughout Luke, 
that whenever Jesus prays, it's right before big moments and his baptism, before he chooses the 12, before Peter's, uh, or after Peter's confession in the transfiguration, even the son approaches the father. And so when we pray, when we pray to God, let us pray for the things of God. Let us pray for his presence. Let us pray for God himself. Pray with boldness, with intention, with the shamelessness, and pray with complete dependency on the God who is, who was, and is to come. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. We thank you that you are God, that we are not. We thank you that you care about what's going on in the universe, things that are far beyond our imagination. And even as you're working in that, you're also working in the minute details, in the mess of each and every one of our lives. Father, we recognize that this world is full of evil. It's chaotic. It's violent. We worry for each day. So we want your kingdom to come. We want your love and justice and peace and righteousness to fill the earth so that there will be no more tears and no more pain. Father, we commit ourselves to you. That there's nothing good that can come from uh, within us, but that you are the giver of life and you provide for our every need. Help us to love others as you love us to forgive others as you've forgiven us. May we honor you with our thoughts. May, you, may we honor you with our words and our actions. God, would you be glorified by all that we do. We love you. We give thanks to you. We pray all these things by the power of the Holy Spirit to King Jesus. Amen.